Good afternoon. Um, I have the, the privilege as president of the university to welcome you to the president's panel entitled Challenges of Healthcare, Perspectives on the Future. Um, I'm so pleased to see so many people uh, uh, be with us at this event. And I'm delighted to have you here to listen to a distinguished group of panelists discuss this very important topic. <coughs> Why we have selected the challenge of healthcare as a topic for this uh, year's meeting should be obvious. As we enter the second decade of the 21st century, we un our understanding of life science and human health continues to advance at an absolutely astonishing rate. Modern genomics, instrumental scans and detection, physical and pharmaceutical treatments have advanced dramatically in the last decades. Yet affordability, qu affordable quality health care remains an elusive goal for citizens of the United States. And simultaneously, many parts of the world struggle to deliver even elementary care to their people. This mismatch, the mismatch between science and therapeutic advancement, access and cost, is one of the most challenging problems that our country and the world faces for the decades ahead. We brought together five outstanding individuals to discuss the challenge of health care with you uh, this afternoon. The panel will be led by Dean of the Boston School of Medicine and Provost of Medical Campus, Karen Antman. Karen is an internationally recognized expert on breast cancer and malignancies. She became Dean of the School of Medicine in 2005, and prior to coming to Boston University, she served as Deputy Director of Tra for Translational and Clinical Sciences at the NIH in, from 2004 through 2005. And for the prior 10 years, she was a professor of Columbia Medical School and director of the Cancer Center there. She's published over 300 papers and several edited texts and monograms on oncology and related topics. She also has served as the president of the American Society for Clinical Oncology and the American Society of Cancer Research, among, among other uh, organizations. Karen, please. Thank you, Bob. Welcome to what I hope will be a uh, vigorous discussion. Uh, certainly this is an area that has been defined as a political issue. Others have defined healthcare as an economic issue, and I think many of the physicians across the country define it as a major public health issue. Uh, today we have uh, four panelists from different aspects of healthcare, and I'd like to introduce them. The first is uh, my distinguished colleague, Tom Lee, whom I've known now for decades. Um, he's the professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and head of uh, the um, community health care at Partners. He went to Harvard College, Cornell Medical School, uh, has an MPH from the Harvard School of Public Health, and he's an associate editor for the New England Journal. Um, with James Mungan, he's recently authored a book called Chaos and Organization in Healthcare. So I think he's eminently qualified uh, for this role here today. The second panelist is Kate Walsh. She's president and CEO of Boston City Hospital, um, Boston Medical Center. Um, <laughs> that was an interesting <laughs> slip. Uh, <laughs> The, um, in psychiatry, you learn that, that there is no such thing as a Freudian slip. Uh, that, that, but in any case, she got her BA and MPH from Yale. Um, she has plenty of experience in Montefiore, Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, St. Luke's, uh, Roosevelt in New York, Health and Hospitals Corporation. Uh, she's been senior VP of medical services uh, and the cancer center at Mass General Hospital and uh, was the, C, the, the operating officer at Novartis uh, Institutes for Biomedical Research before going to the Brigham uh, as the uh, chief operating officer, and then we were uh, privileged to recruit her recently to Boston Medical Center. Um, I believe that Massachusetts is actually in a leadership position nationally because we've adopted our healthcare reform three or four years before the rest of the country, and therefore I believe that, that we are at the cutting edge or bleeding edge, depending on how you'd like to see this. Uh, President's uh, Healthcare uh, Challenge also is delighted to have uh, Cleve Killingsworth as our third panelist. He uh, has his degree from MIT, uh, did his um, MPH in public health at Yale. He's also served on uh, a number of uh, 
different groups from all over the country, from uh, Seattle through Boston, and most recently uh, has just retired as the president and CEO of uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. And finally, uh, George Annis is, uh, went to Harvard Law School, uh, Harvard um, AB, Harvard Law School, um, and also the Harvard School of Public Health. He is a uh, chair of a department at our School of Public Health and also writes for the New England Journal on ethics issues, um, and we're delighted to have him participating as well. The structure of this will be four questions. Uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the U.S. and programs in other developed countries? Uh, compare the Massachusetts health reform um, uh, uh, laws to those of the country currently, uh, and then to talk a little bit about this, the um, information or accuracy or spin of the current uh, political debate. Geographic variations in medical co costs, what do they mean? And finally, where would we like to be in a decade? What are the risks of us not getting there? What we will do is put up each question. The panelists will make their comments from their different perspectives, and then we will open up the floor after each question for discussion as long as we can and within the, the uh, realities of the time commitment. There will be two people, one in the back and one in the front, with mics. So put up your hand. They will hand you a mic, and you'll um, participate in the, in the discussion. So the first question is, what is the structure, strengths, and weaknesses of the current healthcare system uh, in the United States and in other developed countries? And I'd really like to keep this from being US versus the UK. There are lots of other developed countries in the world, I think, that have great models. So Tom. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Karen. And I'm, I'm very happy to be here. You know, speaking from the perspective of a practicing physician and someone who works with other <coughs> clinicians trying to deliver health care, I wanted to make a comment about a strength and a weakness of health care in general. Uh, but in each case, I think in the, in the United States is a bit more extreme, although not qualitatively different from the rest of the world. Uh, the first in the, in the strength department is, I think whatever our problems might be, I think it's important to remember that we are living in a golden age, and we would never, ever want to go back. And uh, this, uh, the, what I show in the slide is a figure from what is still the most frequently cited article from the New England Journal of Medicine from this century, is from Dr. Antman's discipline, Oncology. And it shows a CT scan with a chest socked in with tumor uh, on the left side. And then after treatment with one of the smart bomb cancer drugs, Iressa, uh, the tumor has resolved uh, on the right side. And this particular article was not actually about the drug. It was, uh, the, it was about a test which identified the tumors that were exquisitely sensitive to the drug. The drug came out, it seemed like a great idea, and they tried it in a whole lot of patients, it didn't work. Uh, but that happens a lot in medicine. But then they noticed that there were a small percentage, about 8% of patients in whom it really worked. And, and in some cases, metastatic cancer uh, would go away completely. And, and one of the cases that set off the, these mass general researchers on this uh, in 2002, it, she's still alive and just fine after having had tumor in her liver and bones and her brain. Uh, so, but these researchers identified a mutation, a test that would detect mutations in uh, lung cancers and that would identify those patients that were exquisitely sensitive to the drug. And this may sound like it's theoretical, but one of my own patients, I'm a part-time clinician, but one of my own patients just this last May, uh, she was diagnosed with metastatic adenocarcinoma of the lung invading the pericardium, the covering of her heart. And we had a long discussion, and we put her into hospice care. I actually had hospice go to her home. After hospice made its first visit, the test came back positive. She had the marker for the mutation in the tumor that made her sensitive uh, to, uh, and we gave her the successor drug, Tarceva. And in fact, her tumor has shrunk down to what, you know, we, there's something there, but it certainly is much smaller, and it is not growing. And I don't know whether it'll come back or not, but we've certainly given her a year or two. And I can tell you, it is actually, I, it took me several phone calls to stop hospice once I had actually started it, uh, but I was <laughs> delighted to do it. So we would never, ever want to go back. 
Now that's the good news. Uh, now the bad news is, and it's not so much bad news as the challenging news, is that all this progress, I, I think this progress is the big root cause for a lot of our challenges in healthcare. Not just our economic challenges, but our safety and our quality challenges as well. Because it, gener it generates cost, but it generates chaos. And the point that I think afflicts every country in healthcare, but particularly the United States, uh, is that this progress has been imposed upon a fragmented delivery system that was developed in an era where individual doctors carried the ball by themselves. I'm not that old, I'm 56, but I was told when I was in medical school, never open a book in front of a patient. But my tutor was serious, and you may have heard things like this too, but you were supposed to give a message that I have everything up in my head. I am, the, you know, your healer. And in that era, it barely seemed possible that we tried to do it, but it's clearly impossible today. I mean, last Thursday when I seen patients, I was using Google right in front of them, asking them to spell the things they wanted me to look up. So it's, uh, you, know, we're, you know, no one can take care of patients all by themselves. We've got this sort of situation where doctors have a choice of knowing, my younger brother made this joke, knowing more and more about less and less until they know everything about nothing, or what he says I've done, which is know less and less about more and more until you know nothing about everything. So you have this. You must be speaking. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have been right. <laughs> I'm really sorry. For, for uh, so, you know, we have you know too many. It, you know, to deliver state of the art care, it takes. We, we've proliferated the number of people, and they're not working that well together. We have too many people, too much to do, and no one with all the responsibility or all the information. And that runs through, I think, every country's health care, but particularly here in the United States, where we've had the resources to have many, many specialists, many, many tests, and so on. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm Kate Walsh. I'm the uh, president of Boston Medical Center. And I um, thought about this question from the perspective of somebody running a facility that's largely government paid. When Karen asked me to serve on this panel, I said, oh, no, I'm up here with all these professors. I don't really know about the comparative effectiveness of, of the healthcare systems around the world. But what I do know is uh, the challenges of running an organization that's largely paid by government sources. And um, my, this slide is up here. Not so much that I expect anyone to be able to read it, but I wanted you to know it's from the, the liberal bastion uh, think tank of Bain Capital. So I think the, uh, the, 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 the notion here is as, as we move, as, as healthcare reforms in the United States and migrates closer to systems around the rest of the world, one common thread of those systems that are successful in other parts of the globe is that they are largely paid, they are largely government paid. There may be a quasi-public-private partnership, but in general, the bulk of people in other parts of the, of the world, at least in the industrialized world, get their care through, through, uh, through government paid entities. And I think what has happened in our hospital, which is 80 percent government paid, is that when funding when government funding changes or drops, you have a dramatic challenge in, 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 in meeting, your, meeting your budget. And this, uh, this uh, chart is a bit of an eye test as well, but basically it says what has happened to payment at Boston Medical Center since the advent of health care reform. As you can see, our poor patients, which are represented by the vertical bars, those patients who are either uninsured, underinsured, represent, uh, re um, insured by Medicaid or insured in now post health care reform in Massachusetts by something called a connector product or Commonwealth care. Those numbers have not changed for our hospital. The light blue line, which is our which are our costs, thank you, Karen, have gone up more than they should and more than my colleague who used to run a health insurance company would tell me they should do. But the red line is our reimbursement. Uh, that reimbursement comes from the government and it has dropped dramatically. And I think the cautionary note as, as the rest of the country moves towards health care reform and as we look to other parts of the world to think about how we fund, fund access for all is that we really need to think a little bit about how we're going to pay for it. And it, it goes without saying in many ways, but I think the notion that access itself will cure our health care ills is, I think, a little bit short-sighted short because much of what drives the costs of care for the patients that we see at Boston Medical Center is that they're, they're low-income people whose, whose lives are challenged by other, by, by other factors in their life. So you know, thinking that access is going to cure health care costs is a little like thinking it's going to cure poverty, which it hasn't done, at least in, in my neighborhood. Please, please. Please, thank you. I, I actually don't have slides. Uh, when, it turns out that when you retire, 
all those wonderful people who used to help you with that stuff, they, they go away. <laughs> I would have helped you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'll keep that in mind because it's either that or I'll go to PowerPoint class. Uh, I would, I, I would um, offer that um, I think the strength of our system is that uh, for the most part, especially for tertiary kinds of uh, issues, but for the most part, the majority of the care uh, that people get here in our country is probably pretty good care. Uh, I can't think of any other place I'd like to be in the world if I were sick and needed to get needed to get services. And I also think that the medical education system in our country is also very strong. And I think that it serves as a basis for the place we need to go. I mean, the medical education system kind of retask will take us to a place I think will be very strong in the long run. We'll talk a bit more about that later. However, we do have some significant performance problems in, in the American healthcare system. Uh, for example, uh, many people in this business believe that as much as 30% of the care provided in our country uh, is, uh, consists of clinical waste. So that's 30% of $2.3 trillion, enough for any society to achieve its greatest kind of aspirations. And uh, when I was at Blue Cross, we purchased about $13 billion worth of care in the state of Massachusetts uh, every year, and we were concerned about the clinical benefit of almost half of it. We didn't have any data to demonstrate to prove that that care uh, half the time was uh, effective. Uh, a way of thinking about where to go in terms of the things that are a problematic in terms of performance is to just give you a very short part of a very long list of uh, things that we know have been prob are problematic. For example, only 50% 50 50 of the 100 million antibiotics prescribed annually are clinically necessary. There are 400,000 unnecessary C-sections in our country, and for those of you who know that operation, it's a very serious operation. It's not a minor procedure at all. 14% of coronary bypass graft surgeries uh, uh, may, in fact, ultimately be unnecessary. Medication mistakes injure 1.5 million uh, people every year. 15 million incidences of medical harm occur in U.S. hospitals every year, and 98,000 uh, people die in the nation's hospitals each year through avoidable medical errors. Uh, the, the, according to the New England Healthcare Institute, uh, unexplained variation in the intensity of medical and, service and, and, medical and surgical services uh, add up to $600 billion every year. Uh, misuse of drugs and treatments constitute $52 billion. And uh, about the other systems, I would just say this. I, I haven't uh, had the uh, opportunity to travel extensively to visit these different places. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but I, will, I think it's fair to say that regardless of the way systems are paid across the country and regardless of the big variance in costs, all of the systems around the world uh, suffer from these problems, the kinds of things that I've just mentioned. Okay. Uh, just heard three panelists kind of avoid the question. I want to avoid it too, kind of pick out <laughs> another country that's better than us because we all believe we're in a golden age and no place we'd rather, rather be. We've got problems, but other people must have worse problems. I don't know. I'd, uh, I'd rather be in Italy. This is <laughs> <laughs> on vacation, right? Not to be treated. <laughs> uh, okay, Monte Carl. Uva <laughs> okay. Reinhardt, who's probably the uh, country's leading uh, health economist, has said, and I've had uh, the horrible experience of speaking after him in a couple of major conferences, he's a wonderful Good speaker, job. that... Uh, uh, Americans suffer from the best in the world complex. That whatever you say about the American healthcare system, you've got to say it's the best in the world. And uh, so we're not going to look to other places. I mean, he goes so far as to say that Americans, if we had an elephant and it uh, uh, went to the bathroom on, in front of him, they'd go up and sniff it and say, best in the world. <laughs> that whatever we have, it's the best. And there's no way politically you can make an argument to Americans that we should have the Canadian system or the British system or the French system or, the, or any other system because we're Americans and what we have is the best in the world. And Americans don't believe what we just heard, that things are really horrible, that there's a lot of mistakes, a lot of people are killed. Even though 55% of Americans say they're dissatisfied with their health care uh, and 50% say there's 
5,000 or fewer deaths due to medical errors in hospitals. Well, it's 100,000, and it could be a lot more than that. They think it's a lot safer than it is. 92% say there should be mandatory reporting of serious medical errors. Uh, you know, how, what percentage of physicians believe that? It's 1%. Uh, so there's a tremendous disconnect between the American public, what they think, and uh, what actually happens in hospitals and in, in the medical system. And I don't want to say we don't really care what the Americans, what American patients think, but we, I don't think we do. You know, you, you never see, well, let's ask, let's ask patients what do they want. Let's try to figure out how to, I'm, we're going to ask you, by the way, how would you, how would you change the healthcare system if you could change it? Uh, there is a, Kaiser does this survey every, every year, this is a couple years ago, but they ask the same questions from people in six different countries, Australia, Canada, Germany, New Zealand, the UK, and the US, and we routinely rank last of these countries. Uh, we, we, second to the last on quality of care, because we're in the golden age, but access, efficiency, equity, I mean, equity is kind of a joke in our country, and healthy lives, which is another kind of a joke, uh, which you would think would be the goal of our health care system. Uh, well, we'll argue later what the goal is. In any event, uh, there's no question that we should be looking abroad, to, not to duplicate anybody's system, but to see if they know something we don't know, because we obviously have got major problems here. Uh, but the context I always should have to be, we spend a lot more money per capita in any way you want to measure than anybody else. So we should have the best system in the world, and we should be able to make it available to everybody. So now's your opportunity to uh, ask questions of the panel uh, or make comments. Uh, certainly in this country, we do have three classes of health care. We have first class, coach, and standby. Uh, mm -hmm. And for diseases such as cancer and heart disease, maybe maybe Americans are a little uncomfortable with the standby part. Um, so questions for the panel? Maybe somebody wants to start with a question of another panelist while the people there's start a, a question getting here, the microphone. Karen. Yeah. Okay, good. You might stand up and say who you are. Thank you. My name is Larry Greenberg. I was a student of Dr. Annis's uh, 33 years ago, so it's nice, wow. nice to see you again. <laughs> you too. Um, I'm a practitioner. I live in Martha's Vineyard. And um, I guess I, I'll ask the panel um, to treat patients and get a fax uh, from their insurance company, not Blue Cross in this case. Um, but <laughs> asking me if we'll take a 20 or 30 percent discount if we get paid in 10 days. Well, I bill electronically these days now, and I get paid in 8 to 12 days. So getting paid in 10 days is not really an incentive for me to drop my fees 20 to 30 percent. I guess my question to the panel is, and the question that I often uh, remark back to these companies is, what have you done in this case that you deserve a percentage of the fee that you're asking me to drop my fees to take. Who wants to start this one? <laughs> I think that's your question, uh, Cleve. Yeah. <laughs> you know, not very much. Not very, not very much at all. Um, you know, it, it's interesting that uh, insurance companies, I believe, are have been complicit in all the problems I just described in other aspects of the delivery system. And I think people are beginning to understand that now. Uh, because of the scrutiny that insurance companies were under during the health reform uh, discussion. But I think the other thing that people who are, are, become, are beginning to understand as a consequence of that scrutiny is that insurance companies uh, have a limited role in the overall delivery system. And that role is even, is, is even further muted by the fact that employers want everybody to be in the network, which means that insurance companies have hands are tied when it comes to taking steps to really deal with the healthcare cost problems that emerge from the delivery system. And so you end up with little silly things like that, you know, as insurance companies try to reach out and do what they can to control the cost of care. So I think that silliness uh, is, still has some time, distance to go, but I think it's limited because now that we uh, have passed legislation to cover everybody, we're gonna have to face the underlying problems in the system there's going to be no place else to go. The good news is that there's some answers to how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
you know, I'll, it's always nice to have a minute or two to think about a question before chiming in. Thank you for stalling for me. Please. Uh, you know, and we're better off. It's, well, you know, I work on uh, I work on the provider side, and I assume you're actually you may be billing through the Mass General Physicians Organization if you're a Martha Vineyard physician. I mean, you may be you know part of our family, and uh, and I'm sure a lot of my colleagues you know who may have gotten the same thing were also very upset. Uh, and I, I'd be upset too, and, we, and try to fight that kind of thing. But stepping back and trying to look at the big picture, I think that you know this is part of the dysfunction of the fee-for-service system. Where, if we're in the fee-for-service system, if it's a, if it ends up, you know, the cost, the the effort to make care affordable just focuses on price. You're going to end up seeing a lot of perverse stuff, just efforts to beat down price in any way possible. And this actually is related to a conversation we were having before we started about when, uh, when so much of business transactions about robbing Peter to pay Paul, you know, it's this gamesmanship. And, uh, yeah, and so when, when things start to get really tight, the, the things that people do to delay paying or try to reduce what they pay start to, you know, it feels like a game. And that's not what healthcare should be. Uh, because of because we've got constrained resources and that game is becoming increasingly perverse, that's one of the major reasons why I think uh, so many people believe today that we've got to move to a new payment system. And I actually think one of Cleve's big contributions uh, in his career has been to you know to push Massachusetts, you know, shove in some cases it felt like uh, toward new payment models. You know, it's been a very uh, you know you know courageous, difficult. Uh, effort and it's we have a long way to go in it, but I do think if we don't make that move, we're going to see even weirder things coming our way. Okay, George. I think there's another question. Okay. Hi, Bridget Spence. I graduated in 2005 from CAS, and. Um, I'm a six-year survivor of metastatic breast cancer. I was diagnosed when I was 21. And Mr. Killingsworth, you mentioned um, the astounding rate of unnecessary um, C-sections. Um, in my case, uh, of course, there was discussion around um, genetic testing. Um, there's also discussion around how to communicate end-of-life issues with patients at an early earlier stage, um, talking about hospice. Um, do you go for the, the latest and greatest um, clinical trial, or when is um, too much? Um, when is it enough? Um, whose responsibility do you think it is? Do you think it should be the education of doctors? Um, do you think it's the, how can we stem the vast amount of information that's available to patients, perhaps too much information? Is there some um, studies being made around how to educate our doctors to best have these conversations when genetic testing might not be right for you as a metastatic breast cancer patient when it's not gonna change your quality of care and things like that. Um, can you sure. discuss that? May Thank I, you. Uh, later on there's a question about unwarranted variation in practice around the country. And what you will find is that is a very large amount of unwarranted uh, variation in practice. And the, the reason that's important and related to your question is that in, uh, our healthcare system often uh, is not designed to produce better clinical outcomes or the most effective care. We have to have a healthcare system in the future that is designed and has the incentive to produce better clinical outcomes. When we have a healthcare center that gets paid because of the quality of its clinical outcomes and the effectiveness of care, doctors will have different conversations than the, than the conversations doctors have today. Evidence-based medicine will become important. And in those instances where there isn't evidence, doctors will collaborate in a different way with a commitment to produce a better clinical outcome for each of its patients. So I think that uh, the most important thing we can do in this period, especially in the presence of healthcare reform, is to understand that the healthcare delivery system has to be retasked. We have to ask something different of it than we've asked before, and then we have to pay for, to, in, to, in, to give an incentive and to make payment consistent with producing those better outcomes. And the way to get there, the first step is to change the payment system, as Tom mentioned earlier. The, the only thing I would add to is that I think your, your, uh, your, your very uh, 
personal story, and thank you for telling us that. You you, you look like you're doing very well. I, <laughs> I um, it kind of, I think, crystallizes the challenge we have sort of across the system. You know, at the highest level, there's, you know, everybody understands that we need to reform a system, but there are very practical and important um, you know, individual questions sort of at a micro level. You know, we talk about payment reform up here, but we don't really know what that's going to do to the doctor-patient relationship or the, or the specific interactions or how you run a clinic or what test you send a patient for. And I think that, that this discussion crystallizes just how, how difficult this is and how there really ought to be a a way to depoliticize this so that we can have some sort of light as opposed to all the heat we've had around this. I mean, the the very unfortunate foray that this country took into sort of the discussions of death panels resulted in one thing, a less payment for hospice through the through Medicare. Kind of stupid mm -hmm. if you're thinking about controlling health care costs. But yet, you know, end-of-life care became something you couldn't talk about because it was politically taboo. So I think that, that if we could just figure out a way to talk about this with, with, less, uh, with less political valence, I think we'd get further personally. That sounds a little Pollyanna-ish even as I say it, but there has to be a way to incorporate the very important experiences our patients have at a micro level into a system that, that Cleve describes that will take better care of all of us. Kate, okay, Cleve has just talked about outcome-related payment, but you run a safety net hospital. Are you going to get the same outcomes for, for, for a whopping treatments? six months? But, <laughs> but, um, but um, I, I am. Um, uh, yeah, I think we can what, get the same outcomes. Okay. I mean, that's our job. I mean, our job is, is and we, you know, the Boston Medical Center's tagline is exceptional care without exception. And as I tell the, the team that I work with is the most important thing we can do is demonstrate that is, it is, in fact, exceptional care without exception. We've got the without exception part down. I think we at Boston Medical Center have more work to do on making sure that, that we can, that the outcomes that we produce are replicable, valid, and valid for anybody. You know, I think that uh, one thing that ran through my mind when you were asking your question is that there was a study in the New England Journal of Medicine that came out this August or July with uh, metastatic lung cancer patients, and they were randomized into two groups. I'm sure you know the study well. And standard care or standard care plus immediate palliative care consultation as well. And the group that got immediate palliative care consultation, as you might expect, they were more likely to die at home, fewer days in the ICU. Their family reported, you know, better quality of life and for the entire family as well. What surprised people is that the group that got immediate palliative care also lived longer. They lived two and a half months longer than the, the group that got standard care. This, these were people with a very tough prognosis. And uh, why that happened is actually something that people are arguing about a lot. Like, were we like being so aggressive in people where we we're having trouble letting go that we actually shorten their lives? Uh, or by just having, you know, palliative care folks whose job was to really listen to patients about what was going on in their lives, did we just end up taking better care of them? We don't know, but we're, what we're trying to do now is actually build palliative care automatically into, you know, the care of people at certain pause points in their medical history, as I'll talk about in a little bit. Well, one of the issues is that you that hospice is either on or off, and many in oncology would like to see hospice start from the day of, of, of diagnosis, and maybe the supportive care ramps up as the aggressive care ramps down. Right now, what happens, unfortunately, is that you either have to choose one or the other. You were trying to sh shut it off when you wanted for yeah. very good reason to, to go back to active treatment, and I think that that's probably the problem. Uh, yes, good. Hi, I'm uh, Anna Vasilescu, an OBGYN practicing many years here in Massachusetts. And uh, regarding this structure issue with the strength and weaknesses, I've traveled abroad and come into contact with healthcare abroad a little bit. Um, I want to emphasize a question how do we, in our structure, make our country's healthcare system? Uh, more efficient. We all know what you've all said. There's uh, errors in medications. There's errors in overzealous uh, operations due to many factors. How do we get the healthcare system to look at itself even further and relegate and diminish these um, overuses to get more efficient? And number two, 
In terms of looking at other countries and their systems, you have to also look at their societies. And I don't think as a society we've addressed our health care issue at the societal level, whether it's issues of facing and dealing with issues of dying, which we poorly do as a society, let alone the medical profession. Uh, our whole issue of how do we deal with our uh, rising obesity rates as a society and education. So I think we have to address this on more than just one front. The healthcare industry alone cannot fix the healthcare uh, situation in this country. And are there any ideas that you have about how do we correct the overuse of medicine? Well, I actually think you know we will be getting into some of those things in some of our uh, the subsequent yeah, we things. Mm -hmm. This will be the last question for this section. You'll have yeah. lots. Of, you'll have three other opportunities. Yeah. Ask the next time. We'll, we'll we'll be moving on to the next question and at the next. Um, Iteration. Yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll so I'd say that it may be. Uh, I think we'll rather than like say things now. I'll I'll wait until. But I think they're very. They're you know you're putting your finger on the huge issues. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to comment on this? Vision helps. <laughs> to have a vision. Vision for helps. What healthcare yeah. system ought to be in the future? Okay. The second question for the panelists, and then it'll be open to the uh, to the whole group. Compare strengths and weaknesses of the Massachusetts and federal health care uh, reform legislation, and then the accuracy or spin of current political rhetoric. And I hope I'll get to some, um, with these couple slides, I'll get to some of the issues in that last question. Uh, I mean, first, you know, again, you know, beginning with that sort of on-the-ground perspective of uh, someone who sees patients, and I, my patients, I see patients in a teaching clinic, and most of my patients are from the poor areas of Boston, Dorchester, Rochester, uh, uh, Roxbury, Mattapan. Um, you know, I, I can tell you that, um, I mean, I'm a part-time clinician. I only have a few hundred primary care patients, but uh, I do have a few hundred, and my very last one who didn't have insurance from these very poor neighborhoods got insurance last October through the connector. Uh, he's a 62-year-old 62 62 self-employed electrician from Mattapan with diabetes, and he really needed insurance. And it has just been a, it's been a lot easier and better taking care of him since that time. And I think because, uh, you know, because it's so uh, clearly the right thing to do, uh, I think physicians in Massachusetts are you know, virtually all in very strong support of Massachusetts health care reform. They're not all liberals. Uh, they're, not, they're not all for paying higher taxes, believe me. But if you ask them, do they support health care reform, they go, of course. And they, none of them would want to unwind it. Because once you've seen, once you've recognized that uh, you know, the choice between figuring out how to make health care work or the, the worst challenge of pretending that you don't see people who have insurance, don't have insurance when they're living among you, uh, it's a lot better to take on the first problem than to, than to live with the second one, pretending we don't see these people. Now, I also think uh, that what we did consciously in Massachusetts, which is make a decision to deal with costs after addressing coverage, I think it was the right thing to do. I think it was the smart thing to do. It was not the cynical thing to do by any means. Because I think everyone who was really working on putting together political consensus around health care reform back in 2006 recognized that when you address costs, you're taking away someone's revenue, and, you know, and they will try to sabotage what you're trying to do. Uh, you know, a Chinese saying my, my, my father told me when I was growing up all the time was, the most brilliant plan can be sabotaged by a single person. And when you start dealing with costs before you've got everyone covered, you are basically creating a lot of saboteurs. Um, but now, now in Massachusetts, you know, we are ahead of the rest of the country. We do have virtually everyone covered, and we really have to deal with costs. And there are all sorts of political and market forces that are forcing us to really deal with it, and I won't go through them all, except to tell you, I think every provider organization in the state recognizes that, like it or not, they really have to be part of the solution going forward. And so that fundamental, the fundamental change is coming in this, what I think some of us see is a historic moment, and truly historic moment, a precious moment, where our idealistic aspirations and our pragmatic imperatives have converged and they've become one and the same. The only wise thing to do from a business perspective is to do the same kind of things that are the idealists among us have been hoping for for years and decades. 
Uh, the reason is that fee-for-service is increasingly unsustainable, as we were hearing earlier on. So the providers, uh, including my own colleagues, recognize that they need to adopt new payment models. It's not a matter of idealism or charity. They need to, because if they don't, they are going to be unable to pursue their other missions and unable to keep their, uh, you know, keep their business going. And as we think about what we have to do on the provider side, there are these certain themes that keep coming up. Uh, you know, you cannot get by by turning down the thermostat. Uh, it's, you have to redesign care, uh, integration, coordination, team care, rely, reliability. And so without going into any of these in, in any kind of depth, I can tell you the three sort of little buzzword phrases that uh, my colleagues and I are using as we try to plan our work, uh, we're talking about Porter strategy, Gawandi tactics, and Bomer operations. And what those mean are, you know, uh, Michael Porter, the you know, Harvard Business School professor who's written about value and talks and explores value a lot. You know, value used to be a bad word in healthcare because we thought it was a code word for cost reduction. But what it really is, what it needs to be, is the outcomes that matter to patients divided by the cost required to achieve those outcomes. And what Porter would say is that there, it has to be on a condition-specific basis. There is no one outcome that tells a story for any condition. Is multiple outcomes. And uh, you've got to measure them, and you've got to juxtapose them against the cost. And the goal of people like uh, me and my colleagues is to, Im is to be better next year than we, were, than we are this year, to constantly be improving outcomes by either imp uh, improve value, by either improving our outcomes and or lowering our costs. Uh, the Gawandi tactics is about how do we actually accomplish it. So a lot of you know Vatul Gawandi's work. You know, he's a New Yorker writer, but you know, he's, his big accomplishment has been driving the World Health Organization surgical checklist throughout the world. And that checklist culture is it's really a cultural tool. It's about humility, discipline, teamwork. Uh, so what, the kind of thing that we're trying to do to improve value within these conditions is identify the pause points where we need a checklist of a short number of processes that we believe will improve value by reducing waste, reducing chaos, reducing harm. Uh, and then the third part, Bomer Operations, uh, you know, he's another business guy, but what he teaches is that clinicians in general, but physicians in particular, have to understand that they are members of teams, because uh, it takes teamwork and integration to really move the needle on any of the things that really matter today. And, uh, and that this work will never be done. Uh, and that it's, you know, it's basically like being a clinician. Every day you go to work and you're starting from scratch. You know, you, uh, you, our healthcare will never be safe enough or efficient enough or reliable enough. And so that kind of culture is coming to, you know, is coming to, to medicine. So um, I think that I actually feel optimistic that we will deal with the challenges of figuring out how to make all this work. But it will be difficult and will take some real transformation. So um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about what we've learned at, in Massachusetts at a safety net hospital and what I think it portends for healthcare reform nationally. Um, you know, there's a you know, kind of a cynical saying going around with 32 million newly insured Americans, somebody's going to make some money somewhere. But I would submit that the newly insured Americans are, as Tom described in, in the vignette about his patient, are in fact poor. And we think that with increased eligibility for Medicaid across the country, about half of the, about 16 million will end up in um, a Medicaid project product, and the other 16 million will end up in a probably high deductible, you know, a very sort of price sensitive product. So that in fact, the newly insured are going to be patients of safety net hospitals. And what are safety net hospitals, other than I kind of joke, this is the ugliest collection of logos, but um, it's, <laughs> we obviously don't spend enough money on marketing. I'm actually quite fond of Boston Medical Center, particularly compared with others. But these are hospitals you hear about on the, around the country, and these are often hospitals you hear about in great financial distress. People have heard about Grady, people have heard about, about LSU and what happened there after, after Katrina. Um, many of these hospitals are, are, are great places that you'd want to be taken care of. The, the one people always point to Denver Healthcare. Although their tagline is level one care for all, I'm not sure all of us want to spend time in a level one trauma center. Um, but, 
<laughs> but safety net hospitals have, 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 a, have a lot of great strengths. Many of them, like, like Boston Medical Center, grow out of a strong academic tradition. Um, it goes back to the before the Civil War, I think, at, at Boston Medical Center. It was a teaching hospital of, of three major affiliates and now is the primary affiliate of Boston University. Uh, they are primary care focused. We're in the communities. We uh, do take care of trauma. Many of us, to, to sustain ourselves, have developed health plans. Um, we have unique specialty programs, and we are often, and this is really important, the major employer in communities that don't have a lot of jobs. On the weaknesses side, it goes back to my prior slides, you know, we are not well paid for what we do, and we are very much beholden to, uh, to the taxpayers of whatever city or county or state we, we function in. Uh, I said we're subject to some political interference. I'd say that that varies from uh, from organization to organization. Because we've been undercapitalized, many safety net hospitals, this is fortunately not the case at Boston Medical Center, are sort of behind this, the scale in terms of health IT. We have weaker balance sheets. We share our faculty oftentimes with other, with, uh, with other university hospitals. Um, many of us don't have research operations. Some do, Boston Medical Center does. And these are complicated and challenging and often unionized environments. So the conventional wisdom would say, if everyone's got insurance in a city like Boston, People will go to the Mass General, the Brigham, Beth Israel, Mount Auburn, because they don't have to go to the safety net hospital anymore. And that, in fact, as healthcare reform shrinks the, uh, the, uh, the number of patients who need to be in hospital beds and under scanners, there'll be a lot more competition for the patients who now come to Boston Medical Center. In fact, what's happened in healthcare reform in Massachusetts is that the volume um, at, at Boston Medical Center has grown and continues to grow. And I think this is because we sort of wrap around our patients um, services that can help them get well and stay healthy. You know, at Boston Medical Center, we have a lot of, 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 of sort of wraparound social services. We run a preventive food pantry that treats 7,000 patients a month and gives them a three-day emergency supply of food. We have um, refugee health clinics. Many of the hospitals around Boston have very similar programs, but they don't have the, the breadth and scope of them. So I really think that one of the ways through the health access cost outcome conundrum that we've talked about is that I think that hospitals ha who have traditionally cared for poor people, if allowed, if, if given reasonable rates, will actually do quite well in, in a healthcare reform world and will be a big piece of the puzzle for taking care of newly insured Americans. Now this is admittedly a bit of an infomercial for what I do, but I thought I'd put it out there. <laughs> uh, I think that um, this question of the difference between national and Massachusetts healthcare reform I think the important idea is to understand that they were motivated by different things. For example, in Massachusetts, um, before health reform was passed, the state was at risk of losing about a $300 million uh, waiver from the federal government. So everybody was, it was clear to everybody that something had to be done. Also, it had, uh, the idea of health reform large, partially driven by that fact, uh, but the other fact was that Hospitals were putting pressure on private insurers, given the shortfalls in Medicaid, uh, to come up with the difference. And coming up with the difference uh, was a challenge. It was a problem. And then that led to some research about what would it take to really fix the system uh, over time. Um, it was an approach in Massachusetts that was supported on, on both sides of the aisle. You know, there's kind of a bit of a bipartisan approach to it. And also, importantly, the stakeholders who were at the table all got something out of health reform. Insurers got something, hospitals got something, you know, businesses were uh, less threatened by the possibility of a ballot initiative that would have caused them to have to pay more uh, at the end of the day. So everybody around the table got something out of it. And, um, but I think in common, uh, they both suffer from this focus on coverage, although I agree with Tom, at the end of the day, you know, we, that was probably the smart thing to do. But it has to do with how deep the commitment for coverage, ref for payment reform is that merged from the two laws. And I happen to think that the Massachusetts uh, uh, law uh, is much stronger in that regard. And uh, one of the ways to see it is that one of the kind of, you know, kind of hidden components of the law required the creation of a payment commission in Massachusetts to think about alternative forms of payment and make recommendations to the governor and to the legislature. Uh, that little commission, which uh, did something that I think is stunning, something that I didn't expect to happen in my career, basically what it said was, in Massachusetts, over a five-year period, we should move away 
from fee for service as a way of paying for healthcare services to an idea called global payment. And global payment basically says, uh, we'll take, well, if they did it my way, <laughs> it would say, <laughs> we'll take the amount of money we paid in the system to each institution in the past, the most current year, and we'll commit to that in the future, uh, plus some inflation. So what that means is that to get your money, you don't have to add it up <laughs> with a bunch of small services. If you take that question away, then maybe we can focus on better care. So if you take that idea of global payment, a chunk of money up front that you know you're going to get, and you add to it a new target, and the new target is better clinical outcomes. I wouldn't support this if it didn't have the idea of more clinical outcomes. I'm measuring how many little tests you do, but the fact that you actually improve somebody's care. Those two ideas together I think are very important. I'll just give you one example of what I mean by clinical outcomes. You know, uh, for people who have diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, hemoglobin A1C is supposed to be about 7 or less, and it may have changed <laughs> the years, but 7 is what you're after. So I think that under global payment, you should get more money if the population of diabetics that you take care of collectively have hemoglobin A1Cs at 7 or less. And if they're above, you should get paid less money. The point is the focus is on making people actually better versus getting paid for how many times you sent them for eye tests and how many times you sent them for scans and those kinds of things. And uh, I think that's a very important idea as we, as we design a healthcare system for America in the future. So those two ideas, payment reform through global payment, and by the way, there are a couple of other ways to do payment reform. Bundle services is another one. I think global payments is, is, is the strongest. That idea, uh, also needs to become a part of the federal legislation, or at least the regulatory implementation process. And I think there's some potential for that. But let me tell you, the last two years, as I've watched the political process, I've been stunned. And it's not enough, <laughs> as it turns out, to have a great idea. You need a whole different skill to actually see that thing become to fruition. And that is the challenge, I think, that the nation's health care reform system has ahead of us. I think Massachusetts is very much further along and solving that kind of political problem than we are at the national level. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, I think all, all of our, our panelists, my colleagues here, have made the point that we haven't done health care reform yet. We've done one small part of it, a very important part, a very pragmatic part, the part of access to uh, health insurance. And uh, we haven't done that at the national level yet, but we're pretty much there uh, in Massachusetts. And and the question is whether it's possible to do health reform one segment at a time, one of the you know, cost, quality, and access, one of those at a time, or whether you don't at some point really have to do all three of them together. And that's a question. I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. Maybe it's not possible to do all three together. The political problems are enormous, as if we haven't seen it already, we're going to see next Tuesday, right? <laughs> that it's easy to demonize any change in the system because what people have said is absolutely right. Uh, every, someone's dollar of cost is someone else's dollar of revenue, and they will, they will fight to keep it. And it's, this is not going to be an easy, an easy battle. Uh, it's used to have Bill Clinton's six shining stars on this slide. It's on the next slide. But see if you remember uh, when Hillary and Bill were trying to pass health care reform in 1994, uh, Bill, they both gave speeches the same day saying that they were guided by six shining stars, which were security, savings, quality, responsibility, choice, and simplicity. And uh, they're, they're listed there. And I thought the day I heard that speech that health reform was dead in the United States. Uh, <laughs> and, I, you know, you might have thought that for different reasons. But, uh, but it turns out that uh, when Bill Clinton said security was the most important value that Americans had, he turned out to be right. I thought that was like insane. Uh, but he didn't mean just national security, although that is like the number one thing Americans care about, but things like social security too. And just basic security, just to be secure in, in your lives, not to be worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. Can I, am I, can I, am I going to lose my house? Am I going to get a, get a catastrophic disease? Am I gonna, it's going to wipe me out, you know, et cetera. So security is a big deal for Americans. Savings, 
ridiculous. You know, who's saving what? You know, so, so savings was too weird. Quality, we like quality. There's no question about it. We're not sure what it is, but any good healthcare system, any healthcare system worth getting access to, has got to be quality of care. It's no good getting access to a crummy system, right? Responsibility, I continue to believe, is anti-American. Uh, that we will not take responsibility for our own health care. And even though uh, employers are going to do their best they can uh, to get employees to exercise, to not smoke, to eat right, I don't think it's, well, we'll have to wait and see. That's a major public health challenge in this, in this country. Choice is absolutely essential. Whatever health care system you have, Americans at least have to have the illusion that they have a choice. Uh, and, and what Americans think they want a choice of is doctor, which is really weird in many ways, because they have like no way to judge the quality of, of one physician against another. That may have to change, but, but you can't tell Americans you're not going to have choice. They will, they will whatever, because that, that will, just drive them nuts. Uh, simplicity, I love simplicity. I don't know what the hell the Clintons were talking about. Whatever else you think about the American health care system, and it's true in Massachusetts too, it is the most complex, difficult to understand, fragmented, non-communicative and non-coordinated uh, non system. I think in the world, I can't imagine there's another one more complicated than we are. Can't, no. Should the goal be to simplify that? Yeah, we've heard different words. Economists use the word efficiency. Uh, value is really, we talk about it, it really comes down to efficiency. Uh, and the product you're getting, can you get it cheaper or make, get a better product for the same price? Those are all like major, major, major challenges. Uh, for me, uh, I think another big issue and, and, and you know, one of the many uh, tragedies about Senator Kennedy's death uh, was that he was the most articulate voice in the United States for the notion that there should be a right to health care. This is not something we're given to people, you know, because we're generous and all this stuff. But people have a right to health care. It's that important. It's a public good, and the government's obligation is to make sure that everyone who needs medical care gets it. Uh, we don't, we had, did not adopt that with, uh, with the Affordable Care Act. That's, that's still a fight we have, have to go on. But I think it would make an enormous difference in the way we look at health care if Americans saw it as a right, the way actually most people in most advanced countries in the world do. So here's your opportunity to comment on uh, the current political debate. <laughs> yes. And the second person who has a question, let's get that all the way in the back. <laughs> yes. Hello, panel. I'm Fred Thornton, Middleborough, Massachusetts. Uh, CFA 1970 in Music History. Uh, the Republicans have pledged to repeal health care at the earliest opportunity. Now, up until recently, I wasn't too worried about that because, one, President Obama would veto it, or, two, if the Democrats fell into the minority, they could filibuster it, or, three, the insurance companies would be most reluctant to lose millions of new customers and therefore they and the physicians would strongly lobby against repeal. However, recently uh, become aware of, I think it was in an AARP um, magazine article, that the Republicans, if they can just get control of the House, that they would refuse to vote out of committee any legislation that would implement funding for the new health care program, in effect, gutting it right from the start. What can be done about that? <laughs> you know the answer. That's yeah. a political yeah. question, and you have to organize, and you've got to get uh, some Republicans not to do that. I don't think it'll be repealed. Yeah. Well, it's not going to be repealed, but it may not fund it. That's the issue you're right. saying. Yeah, I, I think we have a consensus here. Do, uh, go right down the line. What do you yeah. think is going to happen? I think it's uh, unlikely that in this next term that the, that they will carry through on some of their, their rhetoric. Because I think that there's actually going to be a fair amount of pressure on the Republicans not to appear to be completely destructive uh, for the next campaign, if not this one. Okay. It won't be repealed. She's confident. I think, I think people will act in their self-interest. And what's that? I think it's hard to predict. But, okay. But you know, like, there's like a path that's strong and true, and people will act in their self-interest around that path. Okay. Yeah, I, you know, I think you should, I mean, I'm sure you know this, but there's also a possibility, it's in the neighborhood of 30%, that the U.S. Supreme Court may find the whole bill unconstitutional, 
as exceeding the Commerce Clause authority that Congress has. So I thought, they, I thought our the first phase, the first ruling on that said no. No, no, no we've had first two ruling. so far. They're both, okay. not, nobody's ruled on the merits yet, but there are cases going on in Florida and Virginia. Oh, really? Uh, and it doesn't matter really what the lower court said. It's only going to matter what the U.S. Supreme Court says. Other questions? Moving on. Oh, we have another question? Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is very clarifying, and that's really part of my question. Where has the medical community been to cooperate and be clear with language? Um, CLA 77 political science major, and that really still is the focus here. Um, first, I want to give you my question, and I'll give you a little bit of the context. So if we're against the public health care initiative in many areas and reform and it hits you in the pocketbook and it really hurts because you've gone been to school for 10 years and you have debt and you deserve to be paid, okay? And our physicians, we, we love them as we also sometimes demonize them because of, of some of the power issues. Um, I, I'm wondering where is the, I don't think you can depoliticize this. We're, I'm talking about the cultural and economics and I, sort of juxtaposition with the last person, the impact on the middle class, the people who work hard, are generally healthy. We have a small to medium business, 80 employees. Healthcare went up 18% this year and 15% the year before. So now we're paying a third higher for about 80 employees than we were. If you go to personal choice, we have a daughter with Crohn's, so we wanted the uh, personal choice option and not the, um, the HMO. And she's doing very, very well on Remicade, by the way. Um, so we also had to pay with COBRA above and beyond that because of uh, she was past the college age. So I guess the question is, what is the medical community's response to th these reforms? What is the recommendation for someone who is trying, we all want to be good citizens, we want to help everybody else, but the ever squeezing middle class and the business owner is feeling somebody's got to pay. I guess that's really my question. Somebody has to pay, and it's, it, uh, the more it hurts, then, it, then you're going to lose employees. We're not going to be able to hire as many people. You understand what I'm saying. Yeah. The why, ramifications. Why is medical care 17% of the GNP in the United States and generally 9 to 12 in every other developed country? Cleve, you want to, why is it so expensive here? I would pick a simple, short answer to, to, from my perspective to your question. 30% of, uh, of the care, of the money we spend on care in this country consists of clinical waste. It is the largest and ultimately, I think, only pot of money we have available to us to use to deal with the issues you're raising. If we could capture that money and re-spend it in the system, but spend it on care that's effective, what we're going to find is that the cost of care is going to go down. And that has to happen before you begin to see premium release, relief and you'll begin to see the, the real promise of all Americans being covered. If that doesn't happen, keep an eye on it. If we don't get rid of that chunk of money, you will see acrimony for the next 10 years. Geographic variations in medical that. costs, what do they mean? Why do we have such variation in medical costs? Uh, yeah, and you know, I think this pertains to the waste question and uh, as well. And uh, one thing I would say is that I believe, agree with Cleve that there's 30% of waste. I see it in my own, in the, my own patients. But the funny thing is, I, it's never anything I did. It's always things other doctors did. And they may not have thought it was waste. Because you know, medicine's complicated. And it's often hard to know what the right thing to do is. So I think the variation is actually a huge issue of getting at that opportunity to try to reduce costs. Now, one thing that I've learned is that my colleagues, they don't really care about what's going on in Miami or Minnesota. They don't even really care what's going on in other institutions around town. What they do care about is what their colleagues right around them are doing. And so one of the things that uh, my colleagues and I believe is most important to try to make healthcare better and more efficient is getting an individual variation more than regional variation. So this is from one primary care group in our network of partners. They were leaders that didn't come from the Brigham or Mass General. This was a community group. This was their, their first time they did this, which is in September of 07. They showed their radiology use 
by individual doctor, the number of tests per thousand, and there weren't, and the, there are different colors for the different tests. It said John, it says John Doe here, but when they gave out this report, they gave it out with everyone in the room with the names unblinded. Mm -hmm. And then they had the three doctors on the left stand up and talk about why they were practicing different from their colleagues, what they knew that no one else knew. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, and this group, even though they actually owned their own radiology equipment, had a 15% drop in their radiology use immediately after they started this peer pressure intervention. Now, uh, you know, why is there so much variation when, you know, everyone would like to think medicine is a black and white issue. Uh, it's not black and white. And, you know, physicians are overwhelmed with information. They've got gaps in knowledge. I think people who know more often tend to get to answers in fewer iterative cycles. Physicians are human. They vary in their tolerance of risk and uncertainty, and some more experienced people can live with a greater level of uncertainty. But then there are other things which are cultural, which are increasingly, with all the proliferation of experts and specialists, uh, clinicians are isolated, and they don't have a way to develop group consensus. You know, there's no doctor's dining room anymore where people sit around and they talk about things and you learn what the conventional wisdom is. There is no conventional wisdom because people aren't getting together to talk. Uh, and, uh, and then the clinicians are influenced by local norms where they're trained in their current environment. But the irony is that clinicians often do not know how they compare with their colleagues. And so that is, I think, an important strategy for, uh, for going forward is to actually show the variation at a micro level to the people taking care of patients. And I took a different, I took a different approach to this question when I thought about it, uh, thinking less about geri uh, geographic variation, but variation within this city based on race, race and ethnicity. And I have a number of slides, but we're supposed to move it along a little bit quick, more quickly. Uh, I should um, reference that these data were created by a group at Brigham and Women's Hospital. My colleague Wanda McLean runs that group now. And it's the Division of Community Health and Health Equity. And for the last 10, 15 years at the Brigham, they've been working very difficult, very diligently to try to solve a, a gap in, in um, infant mortality rates between whites, Latino, and African-American patients. And they've expanded that work more recently to include um, all races. So I'm just going to flip through a few slides just as food for thought for the audience and for the panel to talk a little bit about the, the disparity in, in rates. As, as you can see here, in the city of Boston, blacks die at a higher rate than whites and Latinos and the citywide average. On the racial, the uh, racial and ethnic disparities, the good news is Massachusetts is kind of beating the uh, is beating the uh, U.S. average. But in fact, um, even in Massachusetts, where we're doing better than the average, uh, blacks have lower birth weight babies at a higher rate. And the, and, the, and the healthy person's goal is 4.5. So you can see that even if we were working to do this, the uh, the, uh, the goal within Massachusetts is, is still far where it, we're still far where far away from where we need to be with uh, with our African American patients. Uh, this is a long, uh, hard chart to read, but basically it, I pointed put it out to say that the Brigham has been looking at these data. They do 9,000 births. It's not sort of a, a cohort problem, and they've really been struggling to work on this on this disparity in birth rates for over. For, for over 15 years with relatively little success, which speaks to the fact that these are complicated problems. This is not a question of access. It's not a question of, of people not getting prenatal care. It's not a question of, of cost or coverage because every single person, every single woman in the, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts when, when she is pregnant has health insurance by definition even before 2006. So, so why are we still seeing these disparities? And finally, if you think about health care costs, um, in the city of Boston, blacks and Latinos are hospitalized at, at about almost twice the rate of whites. Very briefly, uh, I think that, uh, first I agree with Tom that doctors in Boston don't, or Massachusetts don't really care what doctors in other parts of the country do. They just assume whatever they're doing here, we're doing here is better. Um, <laughs> so we don't really have to know what other people are doing. But as a general rule, I would say that it's more important to concentrate on the things that American medicine has in common across the states than it is to look at what things they do different. Uh, and I would say that these are the four major characteristics of American medicine. I don't, that it's technologically driven, death denying, individualistic, and wasteful. And my main point I'd make about that is not that that's an indictment of American medicine. That reflects America. Those are, those are things what I'm saying about Americans, not just about American medicine. Because in this case, American medicine actually does reflect the population. We are. We love technology, obviously. We are death-denying. You would think nobody dies in this culture. Uh, 
we take our, our elderly people and we warehouse them for their last 10 years of life. Uh, uh, a colleague of mine, Appy, has said that he thinks when we look back on the U.S. today, we'll see that as a major crime of our society, the way we treat our elderly people and the way we, uh, and, and long-term care has not even been mentioned here today. Uh, we're individualistic, that's what we, we're proudest of that, and we've heard enough about waste, we know we're wasteful. Uh, and this was uh, during the Clinton times, uh, the best spoof that, that they did on themselves, on, on the Clinton health care plan. Hillary's saying to Bill here, uh, and this is out now on YouTube, and uh, one thing I do love about YouTube is you can finally get access to this film, which was like a state secret during the, the Clinton administration, because they thought it was a mistake. Uh, she says it's on page 27,655 of our plan. It says, quote, eventually we all die. <laughs> to which Bill responds, there's got to be a better way. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that's how we, I think we all agree that that's true of American health care, what we don't agree on, what exactly that better way is. <laughs> all right. Questions? Questions? <laughs> So we, we agree that there is wide variability in healthcare within small communities and certainly across the country. And many people have used this evidence to say that uh, we could save large amounts by uh, providing similar health care across the country. Back there, get a mic. Good. I actually have worked in the Partners Mass General Healthcare System for 34 years, starting as a physical therapist. How much effect would a universal electronic medical record owned by the patient have on the efficiency issue? Cleve, this is your question. I actually think not much. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you why. You. you know, building a, a kind of universal automated medical record system for everybody without retasking the healthcare system. Uh, I think is a mistake. You know, under, under the uh, Bush administration, you would get the impression that it's all about connecting doctors and hospitals and the rest electronically. Right. And, and I think that that's not true, and I don't think there's any evidence to ultimately prove that. There are hospitals in this country who are completely electronically wired, and they can't prove that the quality of their care is any better than anybody else's. So I think you first have to say, we're going to build a healthcare system in America that improves clinical outcomes, and then ask, what do we need to do that? The answer to that question for IT will be the correct answer. Anybody else want to answer that question? You know, I, I think that I, I'm sort of would cleave in that it's, you know, it's a means, it's a means to an end. It's not the, it's not the end. And it may, might enable some things that will make care better. That's what, that's, I think Cleve's right. That is where the biggest potential is, and the number one focus should be better outcomes. But then it, it should enable us to reach them without raising costs or even more efficiently. But it will not solve the problems on its own. Certainly the VA system is rather good in the fact that the overhead's 2%, which is considerably below the rest in the United States, which is 25 or so percent. And when in Katrina, when the people in, uh, in the storm got moved to Texas, all of their records were available in Texas. So certainly having that kind of uh, database makes it better able to, for us to take care of patients. Esther? Esther Hopkins, uh, CAS 47. You've talked about uh, geographic variations in medical costs. I haven't heard you mention the effect of having um, for-profit hospitals as a part of the system. What effect will they have on them? Well, you know, I think it's a very thoughtful and insightful question, and it's uh, more subtle. Uh, I think that, you know, I'm probably, I was probably negligent by not bringing up the fact that the truth is that uh, supply drives resource use. And you know, an MRI scanner is gonna get used, it's gonna get filled. And, uh, and so for-profit organizations and not-for-profit organizations that are behaving like for-profits, you know, focused on their margin, uh, in a fee-for-service world, they're going to build scanners and ORs and everything else and uh, to try to drive revenue, and somehow they're going to get filled. So I do think you know, acknowledging that supply does determine resource use, uh, you know, sometimes appropriate, sometimes not, often not, uh, that's, that's a tough issue for Americans to take on, but it's a very important one. Last question. In the School of Nursing, 69. Um, I just wanted to comment on the electronic medical record. I'm a nurse case manager. I work in Harvard. Harvard Vanguard Medical Associates, and we have a really excellent electronic medical record. Um, the issue of an electronic medical record is that people are inundated 
with information on it. And it takes a very special kind of record to be able to find the information you're looking for when you're seeing patients very quickly. You know, I'll just say there are some, I, the phenomenon you're talking about is very real. There are some really cool things coming. Like there's like a virgin, there's basically Google for electronic records that's, you know, that's actually being rolled out at, at some, of, some places now that enable you to find what you need much more quickly. But uh, the overload phenomenon, as more people get on it, it's become very real. But now the Google for EMRs, not by Google, but by other people, is coming. Okay, final question. Where are we going? Where would you like to be going, and what are the risks of not getting there? Uh, I'm just going to show one slide, which, uh, you know, I'm an optimist, and I think that we are in the midst of something great. And what we're in the midst of is something that's comparable. We're in a change in healthcare delivery that is comparable to the change that occurred in medicine in the second half of the 20th century. I was a history science guy back in college. And on the left-hand graph, you see the decline in mortality from myocardial infarction uh, in the second half of the 20th century. And on the right-hand graph, you see the decline in bloodstream infections at the hospitals of partners uh, over just the last few years. And the myocardial infarction uh, drop, you know, the, I put it up there because for those of you, a lot of you are too young to remember, but people were very fatalistic about myocardial infarction, heart attacks. You put them to bed and you hope for the best. But you know, there were no coronary care units before 1962, uh, which isn't that long ago. And, but what's happened is a whole bunch of interventions have taken the mortality bit by bit down, and it's gone from 30 to 40 percent in, in the 1950s down to 4 percent today. And people feel anything but fatalistic now. The same thing is happening now in healthcare delivery for a whole bunch of problems that we used to consider beyond our control, readmissions, falls, bloodstream infections, and they still are beyond the control of us as individuals, but it was becoming clear because of transparency and public, the pressure of public reporting and new payment models is that we are figuring out that they're under our influence collectively if we work together. So I think organization of healthcare to take on these problems uh, will, will be a very exciting thing for the remainder of our careers. I'll skip this. Um, so I, I, I think that um, where, where I think Boston Medical Center needs to be and where I think the country's going is towards these sort of accountable care organizations that we are, will take responsibility for the outcomes of the, of the services we deliver. I think the challenge, particularly given the situation, the, the, the institution I represent, is that the reimbursement is pretty slow to catch up with the re rhetoric and that we can talk a lot about reforming the system, but we have to make sure that, that, we, that, that the kind of care that, that whether it's a for-profit or not-for-profit organization, that people will do what they're incented to do. So we need to reform the system so that it would, either through global payments or some other mechanism in payment reform, so that we're paid to actually take care of people rather than do things to them. I think that um, that if we can reform, change, and redirect healthcare across the spectrum of services, I think the uh, the point that George made about long-term care is absolutely critical. If anyone's dealt with an aging parent, you know how challenging that part of your life that part of your life can be as you try to navigate systems of care to keep people well and keep them in their home. I think we have to start thinking about how we train clinicians, physical therapists, nurses, doctors. Um, and I do believe that this begins and ends with health information technology. I think that um, when I work with talk to groups of clinicians, the thing they're most worried about is that there's some piece of information sitting on a server somewhere that they haven't checked that's important to their patient. And figuring out the way to get that information in front of people, I, I, I don't think it's the answer in payment reform, but I think it's absolutely a building block. I think that I'm like Tom, I think I'm an optimist. I think this is a system that has plenty of of will. I look at the kind of work people do every day to get uh, to make people better, and I think when you can harness the strength of all the individuals trying to work work towards uh, to keeping us all healthy and provide them with systems to and support to do that work well, I think that uh, that this will work, and and I think that it has to work because I do believe healthcare is a fundamental right for all of us. I am also an optimist about the nation's healthcare system. I think that there's a path forward. I think that it's a, it's a better, more robust, more, um, more uh, connected uh, system than we have today. And I actually think there's a path to get there. And I don't think that the path is too challenging. I don't see anything along the way that requires uh, Nobel Prize winning innovations to make our healthcare system better. I think we know how to do much of it right now. I think that as we uh, think about the people who are participating in the healthcare system, uh, 
drug companies, medical device supply companies, companies that build computer systems to do automated medical records, hospitals who make capital investments, uh, staffing decisions, organi organizational decisions, and health policy, and also the health regulations that are going to flow from the national uh, health reform legislation. We need to ask a, a central question, a simple central question, and that is how much will this, whatever the proposal is, uh, improve clinical outcomes and by when? If we test all these things in that environment by that relatively simple question, it will hasten uh, our movement towards a better system. I'd be remiss coming from a school of public health not to say that prevention is more important than cure and we should, obviously as a society, we're gonna, we need to focus a lot more on just living healthy lives. But we're talking about medicine today. Uh, and the two things that I would say about that, one is we should get rid of our old metaphors, which we still use and, and it really affects medicine a lot. That uh, the military metaphor, that, that really it's a battle with diseases, Everyone's quite good not to use it today, but Tom did start off the panel talking about smart bombs and, uh, <laughs> and, and lung disease. And the second metaphor that we use that we spend much more time about now is the market metaphor. And whatever healthcare is, it's not a market good, right? You, you don't want to get it. You get it because you need it, and uh, you don't bargain for it. Uh, you're sick. You're not a Anyway, it just doesn't work, and so we should stop talking about that. I think everyone agrees we've got to get rid of the fee-for-service model, et cetera, if we're going to get anywhere in health care. But we need to do more than that. Uh, we really are a death-denying uh, society, and uh, we have to get over that. I mean, uh, it's very powerful. The, the Republicans and the Tea Party people realize that. That's where death panels came from. There's no death panels, but they know that. Americans, and not just Americans, just repel, it just, just turns you off. Whenever you hear death, that is true in national security too, uh, you revert back to whatever the status quo is. You don't want to change. Uh, and uh, you know, status quo is not, you're gonna live forever, let's face it. Uh, so we do have to talk more about, and we did hear this on this panel today, quality of care, quality of life versus quantity of life and quantity of care. Uh, this is, I absolutely think this is the, the a, a terrific image of American healthcare today. It's Damien Hurst's <laughs> diamond-studded uh, skull. And uh, basically, to me, it says uh, in healthcare, if you're at the end of your life, you got weeks or months to live, we're going to go all out for you. We'll do everything. We'll give you the you know, diamond-coated medicine, okay. even if we've treated you like shit the rest of your life, right? And you've never gotten anything. Uh, because we agree with you. The worst thing that can happen is that you're going to die. Uh, so we're going to give you the extra three months or three weeks in the, in the ICU. And that's insane. I think everybody in this panel would say that's, that's insane. But we do that for all kinds of reasons. And, and most of the reason is we, we don't think we're going to die. We think if medicine just knew more, if we just made more progress, uh, we wouldn't have to die. And we literally believe that. And then we'll end with this cartoon because I think it's priceless. Here's your new patient's bill of rights. You receive top-of-the-line care promptly and effectively delivered in a compassionate and sensitive manner at no cost to you or anybody else. What's the catch? You died, and this is heaven. <laughs> Questions and discussion? Hi, Mary Lou Madigan, School of Nursing. Uh, my understanding is that more physicians are choosing not to go into primary care, and I would like to hear s the panel's I some ideas you have, suggestions on how we can help the primary care doctor, especially as we're increasing and changing more to a preventive role. No, I, and I think a lot of people are very concerned about that. And I think that, uh, you know, like as Partners Healthcare System looks at the strategy for the future, the bottom line of the presentation we just went through is that primary care is critical. And I think, you know, markets respond. I think that, uh, you know, they'll get paid better, but I think actually the bigger thing is their life will be made more, more sane. Uh, I actually sense a pendulum swinging, to I tell you too. the truth. And, and, uh, and you know, and uh, one of the interesting things is a lot of young folks who want to be leaders are now figuring out that primary care is the smartest, smartest thing for them to go into because 
you are immersed in the issues of the customer, you know, the patient, and you're better positioned, therefore, to be a leader. Okay, please. In a delivery system that is uh, redesigning itself to deliver better quality clinical outcomes, primary care automatically becomes more valuable than it is, has been treated in the system today. And I think that as we move in that direction, you'll see primary care providers not only valued among other medical uh, colleagues, but you'll also see them happier working in that environment because they're doing work that matters in a team um, that is uh, different from the team today. I think the team piece is critical. I think you'll see uh, professionals in nursing, mental health professionals being part of a primary care team in a way that we um, that we can only envision. Social workers, even lawyers, to the extent that that's necessary. So I think there really are. I think it's going. I think the answer is not going to be more primary care doctors doing what they used to do, but but teams of people caring for for populations of patients. Dr. Lou Sullivan. Former HHS secretary. <laughs> oh, now here's the answer. To, here, here's the grade. How do we do? <laughs> well, first of all, let me say I've, I've enjoyed this discussion very much this afternoon, and I think I don't have any major disagreements with what has been said. But uh, I believe that we are not going to solve the issue of um, uh, costs in our system and efficiency without another uh, important uh, segment, which I think is equally important to our health system, and that is literacy, health literacy of our patients. Mm. We need to change the lifestyles uh, here in America because the challenges that we face are such things as obesity. Back in 1990, we released Healthy People 2000. We wanted to reduce the incidence of childhood obesity, and we failed miserably. We are more obese now than we have ever been in our life, and, and all of us know that of course, coming along with that are such things as high blood pressure, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, uh, diabetes, et cetera. So uh, I believe that uh, a strategy to really improve our health system has to, be, has to include a much more vigorous uh, discussion about how do we change people's lifestyles. How do we have prevention being the central focus rather than something, an appendage at the end? So I think our orientation has to change very significantly. We do have the best healthcare system in the world when you look at new innovations, new therapies, new pharmaceuticals. You know, we've had more Nobel Prizes coming to Americans uh, throughout the 20th century uh, in physiology and medicine than the rest of the world combined. So if, if new research is your criteria, and sure we have it, but as some have said, we have a distribution problem but we also need to bring our citizens, our patients, into the equation. They have to be part of this. We have to shift from a uh, sickness care system to a wellness system. We need to learn how do we motivate our citizens so that they stay healthy, so that the, when those uh, who do become ill have access to all of these services because we want to continue the innovation. We want to have the research, but if we continue to try and find better ways to do what we are doing now, We'll never get there. We have to find new ways to keep people healthy. So I think that has to be part of the discussion. I see everyone on the panel nodding in agreement. I think Lou gets the last word, therefore. And let's thank our panel for a good discussion and all of you for coming and asking great questions.